ovoid will be small enough in a round enough uh, ovoid. that the bottom of the inside one basically gets to the point where it stops being concave and turns convex, almost circular. Uh, and that's okay, that can happen. Again, but that relief is only going to be there um, if, if it's larger than, than the top of the ovoid it's floating in. And it needs that fine line uh, around it. That'll show up. Okay, you see at the bottom of this old chest, the little floating ovoids in the center, they have that slitted relief. Matter of fact, all of them do. Uh, it's just split across. That, uh, that this one, um, comes, this is where, I'm on focus. This one is where sometimes you'll see folks do that. Where this is called a trineg or uh, trigon, sometimes people call it. This is a completely modern creation. I've never seen an example of this on old, old pieces. Now, I'm sure I haven't seen every old piece, but I've never seen this on an old piece. Um, so I, I don't personally use these as a relief because it wasn't on an old, an old one. Um, hey, and I don't think ovoids were meant to be, the reason for this shape is to divide a space. Uh, it's called, we're going to learn about these. It's called a, either a split or a trining and it's meant to, uh, divide a U form, uh, originally. So in my mind, in my interpretation of the art anyway, ovoids aren't for those shapes, or they're not for ovoids. Um, so I just want to explain, for those of you who have ever seen this relief, I think that's where this idea came from. But um, I'm going to say don't do that, at least not for the duration of this class. What you do afterwards is going to be up to you. Just make sure your ovoids float above center, you got a fine line around all your floating ovoids. The rest I can deal with. <laughs> I'm trying to find examples of old pieces of these reliefs so I can show you all. The split like that in their eyes? Yeah. Yeah. It's Yeah. <laughs> Okay, here's. That's also a modern, yeah. a modern one. Um, 
it's obviously up to the artists nowadays. It's not something I would do. Um, here is that stacked, oops, stacked ovoid relief. But they just barely did it. The top is still pretty thick, but it needed something, so we put a relief in there. Okay, and it's harder to find old examples of this. Like I said, they're they're more often on much older boxes and chests, and most frequently because they're the ones that still are still around. Uh, old clinket uh, boxes and chests, and and different clinket art will have this relief. As I said, it's a more uh, ancient form of this relief. Uh, I'm not sure how many examples there are of it in this in this book. Ah, just as I said that. There you go. Again, clinket style, fairly thick form line that even uh, even floating relief. So that's what I'm talking about with that top one. Okay. So don't stop. Keep working on these reliefs. Remember, I want a few of each of them, so work on different size ovoids, but make sure, again, that your floating ovoid is big enough that it requires a relief. So we're working on, uh, stop that recording. Um, we're working on, everybody's working on their ovoids. So what we've gone over so far is just the, the outer shape and how to set the inner shape for the proportions of your ovoid, that the bottom is and the sides are the same thickness, roughly and the top is around twice as thick as the bottom. Again, that's, you don't need a ruler or whatever, but roughly that proportion. And then we worked on how to place the floating ovoid, which starts with taking this thickness here and setting it between here and the bottom of the inner edge, and you take this thickness here and set it between here and the inner edge, and that shows you where, roughly, where your floating ovoid should be placed. So. Uh, you can start where everybody else is. Start with, start with the outer one. Draw your inner one, focusing on making sure the your thicknesses go from thin to thick to thin, and then place your floating ovoid with a fine line around it, and practice these reliefs. Those three reliefs. That's what we're doing. I'm going to redraw this uh, largest ovoid here on a new page, in case anyone wants to follow along, I'm going to do that one right now. Is it warm in here to anybody else? Yeah. Open those, yeah, thank you. Oh. <laughs> So that was my thing. I was sitting here, I was like, why am I so sleepy? It's because I'm <laughs> warm and, yeah, Ugh. wake me up. It's really hard for me to fall asleep from sleep. <laughs> okay, again, this, this class is going to uh, pick up in speed throughout the week. Um, 
and you'll see me draw pretty quick from time to time, but I, <laughs> I do take my time when I'm drawing on my own. Um, so aim, aim for, uh, like I said, whether we're able to in this class, during the class, but when you're doing your own drawings, take your time and make sure uh, you're drawing nice, clean drawings. When it, when it comes to painting them or whatever else you're going to do with them, you're going to have an easier time uh, if you've controlled the, the cleanliness or tidiness of your lines. I kind of remember when I made a drum with the paint on it. And it, it really does matter. There's a, they talk about a, the tension of your line in form line, the, the way things curve. Um, you know, the, the lighter tension of this corner as opposed to how tight the tension is on this corner. And that tension uh, is much better expressed with steady, confident lines as opposed to, you know, shaky or wiggly or anything else. And all of that, it's going to be shaky and wiggly when you first start. That's how everybody starts, because it's a matter of building the dexterity to, to make your hand do this confidently. Um, but it's, what I'm asked, saying is it's something to shoot for. Don't feel bad, just like everything else in this class, don't feel bad that you're not getting it today. Uh, just know that that's something to aim for. Again, the, the, the old masters, the work of our ancestors stands up to uh, the quality of work that you'd find uh, in the Mayan and Aztec empires and ancient Egypt and uh, even Greece and Rome. The quality of our sculpture and the, the fineness of our uh, painting and our textiles, everything was high quality, high class stuff. And uh, it's something to, for everybody to, to shoot for. So for those of you paying attention, here we go. Once again, just remember that the bottom and sides of your ovoid up to about halfway should be consistent, fairly uh, parallel to each other. And then it widens up to become about twice as thick on top. Now I say twice as thick, one, I just want to reiterate. You don't need to take a ruler and measure what the bottom is. And it's just you're just eyeballing to what looks good for you. Um, I've had a lot of people ask me in my life, gee, you must be really good at math. And I am not good at math. This is, this is all just, I'm sure there's some mathematical equation to this. I'm sure there is. Yeah, somehow there's something. But I haven't got a clue. Um, but the relation of, of uh, shapes, the, the graduating and thinning lines and all that is, um, I'm sure there's somebody has done some paper on it, uh, but just use your eye. Okay, so I'm going to take this width here, and I'm going to set it the same distance away from the top inner edge. I'm taking this distance here again, just eyeballing. I'm going to put it about that distance uh, from the bottom inner edge. That's where I know to place my floating ovoid. And in this case, because it's not going to have an eyelid, as I'm drawing this floating ovoid, I'm looking at the negative space that's being created around it to make sure that the negative space is also going 
thin to thick. I might even bring it up just a little bit. Thin to thick to thin. So I'm going to transfer this. Okay, so that's three ovoids. Now, before I move on, I just want to point out again to look. So our main form line ovoid here that we're building inside of. Thick at the top, thin at the bottom. If you start right here, it goes thin to thick to thin. Okay? Now look at the negative space I just created by putting that floating ovoid in. Thin to thick to thin. This is always, this floating ovoid is always going to float, remember, 99.9% .9 of the time, above center. Um, the only time I've seen these below center is where they're dropped all the way down so that the, this edge is nearly sitting on the uh, inner edge of the main ovoid, but then there's still a fine line that goes around it to hold it in. Let me, matter of fact, let me show you. Somewhere here. You'd think for all the times I've looked at this book, I would just know where everything is. The tail of this killer whale you see those, these floating ovoids have been dropped down and they're planted right on the bottoms. Um, but look at the negative space created by doing that. Thin to thick to thin around them. It's just amazing to me. Let's see if I can get a little closer. You see that? So they've broken the rule kind of, you know, dropping it, but by dropping it, they're still maintaining that keeping that negative space going from thin to thick to thin. Fascinating. Fascinating. Okay. Now, uh, what, what would I need to do on here before I move on so that I'm not mad at you guys? The thin line. Yeah. Okay, you've got to have a fine line, fine line going around it. That stacked ovoid relief in here. So I'm looking at how thick this is. I'm going to kind of put a line that shows me that thickness. I'm going to do it again here. That just helps me see just how big uh, this <laughs> this ovoid is getting big enough that were I doing this on a piece of my own, I would probably use a form line face, aka salmon trout, like on the eyes of my drum over there. But for the sake of teaching you guys these uh, reliefs, this is what I'm going to do. So again, it shares that top edge of the first floating ovoid. So does the next one. Okay, and the not only does this positive space go thin to thick to thin, so does the negative space in between. I 
Again, please use your tracing paper. Um, don't feel like you're cheating. The old masters used template, templates made of uh, cedar bark. There's a company in British Columbia, somebody invented, uh, you know, like these circle templates that are back here. Uh, they did versions with ovoids. Yeah. Um, and while it is very neat, uh, my, my, the one, my one issue, with it, especially for uh, beginners, is that you should be learning to draw at least your half of your ovoid. Um, but it limits you to the size of design you can do. You're relegated to the ovoids on the template, and that's not realistic for how Formline is built. So um, you'll be better off drawing a half of a really good ovoid and using tracing paper, always. So there you go. I want everybody to have a few of these along with the other reliefs I showed you. Um, I'll sketch this in again. Make sure you're um, shading in the, the proper uh, positive space. Uh, feel free to, if you have an ovoid that has some room around it, um, you can go ahead and use that. Um, if not, draw, draw one that, uh, that we can add to, because we're going to add two U-forms connected to this ovoid. Uh, I'll show you a complex example of something that we're going to do right now. Um, Something like uh, these designs on the ends of this box. So I'm going to explain how those U-forms attach uh, and how that works. So traditionally, if we're talking about classical form line, again, you, that's uh, classical form line is uh, like 1830s to 1880s. That's really the classical high art period of, of Northwest Coast art. Um, although it is much older than that. There used to be, I'll tell you a side story, there used to be a box uh, that's been returned now. Um, I, th I think it's from Sitka. I could be totally wrong on that. Anyway, it was a burial box and they found it. Somebody had found it, dug it up, and it was in the State Museum for a while until the clan who owned it decided what to do with it. To, uh, and I don't know whether they reburied it or put it in a museum somewhere or not. But it's the oldest known example of form line ever found. And they uh, dated it to about 1375 A.D., which pushed back all the experts' ideas of how old form line is. It was full-fledged form line. There was fine lines everywhere they were supposed to be. You could see killer whales on it. It was, it was form line, just like what we could make now. And uh, Where did you say that one? It used to be at the State Museum, um, but it's been returned since. Uh, I'll have to ask Steve Henderson again where it, where it was from. But um, so Formline is, is quite old. Uh, but the period that I know the best and that I like the best is that mid-1800s time period. We had been introduced to contemporary tools, iron and steel tools. Totem pole production had gone through the roof. It was before uh, potlatch ban and before we were told to stop everything. Anyway, okay, classical form line U forms are always going to come off of an ovoid either off the ends, like off either side, or up and down uh, following the, the angle of the side uh, of the ovoid. So what we're going to do right now is we're going to have one come off 
off the right side going this way and one going off the top on this back uh, left corner. So there's the, the guidelines uh, for this. Now you'll see that U-forms always taper as they go away from an ovoid. So just like the ovoid is, is widest at its center and tapers a bit, the U-form that attaches to it continues that gradual taper as it goes out. So it's always going to be narrower at the end than it is where it attaches. Okay? Now, we're going to end it uh, about right here. Now we take the width of our ovoid at the bottom and we're going to extend a, a guideline out that way. There's the width of one of the legs and that same width will be up here. Okay, So the, both these widths are ways based off of the bottom of your ovoid. The top or the head of the U-form, I call it the head, the head and legs, is based off of the thickness of the top of your ovoid. Again, roughly. Okay, so that's how thick the top's going to be. I'm going to turn my paper to the side. I want you to watch me draw, uh, draw this U-form, if it'll show up. There we go. Okay. So it comes off of the ovoid. Again, with that gradual taper. And then curves here. Like this, it's similar to the top curve of an ovoid uh, it might be slightly more uh, more of a hard turn but it's it's very similar same thing on this side curves back and joins this guideline okay so they call it u-form because it's kind of shaped like a u upside down in this case okay now here's that's the easy part the next part goes back to our mantra. Anybody remember what it is? Thin to thick to thin. Okay? So, the line, the, uh, the leg of the U-form isn't going to just come and run into your ovoid. Okay? So, starting up top here, I'm going to... It's got the same curve as the outer edge. Right? Got the same corner as the outer edge, but it begins to reduce in size down to the leg thickness. It comes and maintains that leg thickness for a little while, like that, and then right when it starts to get to the edge of the ovoid, turns down and tucks into the corner. Wish that would show up. See that? There's a grad, it could even taper a little bit more than that, sorry. Okay, so it's thin here, gradually thickens, and then thickens some more across the top, turns back, drops down to that leg thickness, and then tapers up into the corner. <coughs> That's a U-form, okay? So that, then that gets filled in. This is one uh, obvious er area for weavers that that's different in uh, chokehat. A lot of times those just run right into the next shape. That'll just fall right in. Uh, you might find, if you have ever done, uh, I know most of you haven't done much before, but um, I'll draw these connections here where these come down. They'll be very thin, you know, just a pencil line width where they connect in the corners. The, the reason for that, the reason I don't end it a little bit sooner to make it look like how it will when it's painted, when you then go in with a paintbrush, the painted line widens your pencil line. 
so they the, so those connections don't look so thin. Um, my dad will sometimes say that on my pencil drawings. How come that's such thin connection? I'll tell, well, the way I think about it, the painted line widens that connection and makes it stronger. Um, I draw it like that. Another reason, and the reason I teach you guys to draw it that way, is it's important to draw the whole shape and show exactly where it connects. And as we get more complex and some shapes start borrowing parts of other shapes, it's still better to draw the whole thing first and then use this good old eraser to to cut in where you need to cut in um, for practice and uh, well, there's more reasons we'll get to as we get to them but so for the top now this is this u-form is coming off both sides of that ovoid it naturally just flows right into the line and if I were to paint that I'd come along this edge and I'd paint straight out uh, straight out along that edge and then grab this and paint down this edge and then paint out of that corner for that side. So there are all the lines flow from each other. Now on this one this is going to come up off the back of the ovoid turn just like the other one we did. Again, then uh, the, the angle at the top of this is is reflecting the angle of the top of your ovoid. This comes down. Now, it does not just come down and hit uh, the ovoid. What I want you to do, you know, it's, it's taken me a couple classes to work out this terminology. Pretend that there's a U-form sitting right here. Okay, just like this one, but facing that way and draw this edge here. That's how you make that curve to connect it to the form line. So I'm gonna pull out a piece of trace paper here just to show you for sure. Imagine there's a U-form. Right there. See that? That's how that curve uh, is made. So like I said a second ago, the, the lines flow from each other. So in order to create that flow, to have it work in concert with each other, that line has to turn out and, and blend into the ovoid line. Now, as far as the inside, the thicknesses are going to be the same. You're referencing the bottom and sides of your ovoid for the width of the legs and the top of the ovoid uh, for the width of the top of the U-form's head. Comes off the thickness, drops down to the leg thickness, and then tapers down into that corner. Side turns, goes down to the leg thickness, maintains it for just a, just a second, and then turns just like the outer one, but tucks into that corner where it attaches. Almost looks like the top of a bear's head, doesn't it? Not, or, or a wolf. There's not much to, um, like I said earlier, sometimes things can uh, seem complex, but when you really break them down, there's just a few shapes that, that go together in certain ways. That's what form line is. But it's all of the different ways they can go together that make it so amazing. So that's another situation here with the, where that U-form attaches. That's another situation where you're looking at the negative space as you're drawing. Everybody understand what I mean? You're, in order to make that little curve right, I'm looking at this area outside of it, imagining that other U-form there. 
that's how I, that's how I, that's what I'm looking at when I make that first outer curve. Same way I'm looking at this space when I'm drawing that floating ovoid in there. So again, I can't, I can't stress enough uh, how important negative space is. Uh, there's a lot of things that can be done uh, later on that require at this early stage where you're just building what's thought of as it's called primary form line. That down the road is going to influence what you can do in other spaces. Now I want to, sh <laughs> I don't, this is not meant to be overwhelming to anybody. I want to show you something. Um, so all based off of this, this curve and that these space, hmm? oh, thank you very much. So what did I say? Talking about the importance of negative space. I've got a piece of trace paper over this to show you what, what is, happens as a result of making sure these uh, attachments happen properly. So let's just, I'm just going to draw real quick. Let's say, uh, and we'll talk about um, these stylized faces uh, in a few days. Let's say we got a stylized face in here, okay? And we want to put something out here. Well, let's put the body of this little guy out here. So these shapes all fit where they're going because of making sure that those curves and attachments go where they need to go. You can only continue to build in form line if you've made sure that your initial shapes not only themselves are drawn well, but how they connect to each other happen properly so that you can do these neat little things that fill those spaces, like there's an ovoid and a U-form coming off the top with some fine lines um, on top of it. So that's that's why that matters and why I spend the time to make sure to tell you how this curve is created because if you want to put something else here, that matters. Uh, okay, so I want everybody to get a fresh piece of paper and draw along with me this time, and we're going to do quite a bit of this this week. Start um, in the center of your piece of paper, draw an ovoid. <clears throat> hmm? Just real quick. Well, no, I'll, I'll try to go slow, <laughs> slow with me. Or if you have, uh, <laughs> if you have some tracing paper with an ovoid you like, uh, that's okay to, to use that to try to get caught up quick. 
Just get that far for now. Don't don't worry about a, a floating ovoid just yet. Um, we can put one in later, or if you've already done it, that's fine. But, And we're going to uh, have a U-form come off of both sides of the ovoid. So you can put in these guidelines if you like. Again, they follow the curve of that. Not too much curve, but it does follow the curve of that ovoid. start with the U-form on the right just like the last one we did. Again, this is for, for your practice. There's going to be quite a bit of repetition uh, in this class just because these are the shapes you use. Uh, just remember too that U-forms <laughs> 99.9% .9 of the time taper as they leave the ovoid. It does, it's not a lot, but they are just slightly narrower um, at the top than they are where they leave the whatever they're connected to. Remember, thin to thick to thin.
the other side. Same thing. If you'll notice, uh, you might notice, that the, um, the curve where the leg of the U-form tucks into where it's attached has a little bit more curve here where it drops down against this hard corner of the ovoid, just a slight more dip than the top one that has this more gradual curve to attach to. So this, this leg has a nice gradual uh, diminishing as it goes up into the corner whereas this bottom one comes over and has a harder turn because of what it's attaching to. Form line is kind of like uh, putty that way that you have so the ovoid is kind of a firm well you can break into an ovoid too but form line as it's pushed up next to something will be affected by the thing it's being attached to. It's also affected by the design field that you're filling. So, like in this case, you'll see I've got uh, guidelines coming down here. These guidelines are for a couple more U-forms we're going to attach here in a second. But they're coming down at this angle because of the angle of the piece of paper I'm working on. Normally, I would probably tell you for these to come off this way because that's the angle of the ovoid it's attaching to, but form line is influenced by the design field it's on. So those U-forms are going to drop down being influenced by, this, by the angle of the side of the paper. It's the same thing would happen on a bentwood box because of the design field it's on. That changes on like a drum where because it's circular you have to make adaptations based on the design field that it's going in. Um, if any of you thought this was going to be easy or simple, I apologize for dashing your dreams. Um, okay, this next little bit here is uh, surprisingly important. And I'd like to explain it to you before you try to draw it yourself, because there's a couple of very important points to make. Okay, we're going to have two U-forms smaller U-forms coming down off of this corner uh, right next to each other. And there's an adaptation that happens with how they connect uh, and where they should connect uh, that are important both for this combination of shapes going together but also what, ha what is created by them coming together. So here we go. Uh, whenever you have two U-forms that are right next to each other they tend most often to be about the same size. This is going to come over and turn up. And because there's another one that's going to be right next to it, it doesn't do that thing we did on the other one where it curves off of the top of the ovoid. In this case, it comes up and hits right there because the next one is going to come out right next to it and maintain kind of that fine line width like our, the way our fine lines are around our floating ovoids. Comes down then widens, turns, another U-form. This one comes up and attaches like we did before where it curves and joins that bottom of the ovoid. There's a couple points I want to make. Uh, one, remembering this, and that, that these stay this fine distance apart is very important for wherever you're putting two uh, elements together. You want to make sure to maintain that separation. They don't, if you had a microscope, uh, and if I was drawing perfectly, they don't actually touch each other. They come down and touch this leg of this U-form. The other thing that's important about this to remember is I had to make sure that when I spaced where these were going to go, that these the legs of these two U-forms came up here and touched this solid strip of form line. 
I wouldn't want these connections to be happening here because this is already a weak spot because this is connecting to the ovoid. You don't want a whole bunch of fine little points all attaching to the same place. You want thinning, thinning form line when it comes down to attach to be able to attach to a stronger, thicker piece of form line. So that's what you think about when you place these. So at first I had, uh, I thought, well, I'll bring one over and it's like, oh, no, that can't go there. This one would have been all right if I'd moved it over a bit, but I couldn't go further that way because then this connection would have been here. So you have to think about how those connect. Now, as U-forms move away from the original ovoid and they are not necessarily attached to the original ovoid, you can begin to thin them up just a little bit. These ones don't necessarily have to be as thick as this one, they can be a hair thinner. But you see on the inside, even though the outer edge of this is hitting straight, this one still comes up and curves into that point. Same here, it curves out of that point, out to the thickness of the leg, around to the thickness of the head, back to the leg, and curves into that corner. Now, the last thing I'm going to say, I've given you a lot of information. Um, look at this. Now, that's either called a trine egg, or if it's a positive space and this is a painted line, it's called a split. And splits go inside of U forms. Okay, they are created by the curve of two U-forms being next to each other. So everybody give that a shot. I'll come around and help you. Think about spacing, think about where, they're, where the points are hitting so that they're hitting solid pieces of form line. Draw the U-form shapes just like they're supposed to and don't let the space in between uh, be too wide stays very narrow like that. And you can see we've almost created a wing already. So um, it goes back to my point that it's not so much, you know, form line isn't about learning a vast array of shapes. It's learning a vast array of techniques to combine the simple shapes that it's made of to create what you need to create. And there's a whole bunch of different ways that they can connect. These are the simplest ways. But a lot of times on the old pieces, sometimes the simpler ones are the prettiest ones. Uh, it really depends on where you need to design. Uh, and sometimes training yourself to hold back rather than getting too complicated. Um, I mean, if you look at this Bentwood box design, might seem complicated at first, but uh, like this, just this belly design. I'm just going to talk about the belly. There's an ovoid and an ovoid. It has a strip of form line going across the connecting them that acts kind of like the leg of a U form. And they've adapted the edge of this to have what's basically the top of a U form. So there's a U form in between these two ovoids. And there's two U forms on top of that. And there's two U forms inside of it. That's it. You've drawn almost everything that's in this body already. Um, it's not like here, ovoid, U-form, and it's got a little connector leg that's like a U-form like off the edge of the ovoid. So uh, it's more important to me that you draw shapes well than it is that you make complicated pieces. Um, we won't finish this one today because tomorrow um, we'll talk about things that can go inside of these used secondary elements. So far we've only talked about primary elements. Uh, but we're going to add one more U-form onto this top corner. We're going to make it pretty small. I'm going to come up. 
Again, coming at the angle, referencing the edge of our paper. Like that, maybe even a little narrower. And on this, I'm going to show you uh, an alternative to the way we've been showing U-forms up till now with the head and the legs. When you have something this small that you want to add on, what we can do rather than uh, have legs and the head, because it might be, you know, if I were to do that, you're getting kind of you're getting kind of small there. Hey, it's not it doesn't quite look as nice that way. So what we're going to do is just put a trineg in to divide this space. So the way you start a trineg is you you can put a little guideline to kind of split split the space and were this a positive shape you'd call it a split. But in this case we're going to we're going to split the U itself it comes down from the center point it makes a curve just like that U-form curve and then hugs the edge of the U-form. It's attached to down into the corner. The other side comes down, makes that U-form curve here, and tucks into the corner. Other than where it turns, it stays very close together here, just like we did here and just like when you put the uh, fine line around your floating ovoid. And if you've made it that far, please feel free to um, put in a floating ovoid in that ovoid. Whether you put an eyelid on it or just a fine line around it, that's up to you. Just make sure that it's uh, that the floating ovoid is doing what it should, depending on if you have a fine line or an eyelid line around it. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, ask me for help. I mean, it, you could drop it down a bit, and uh, you, you're kind of going away from the flow yeah, I just of your ovoid. Okay. Drop that. I would drop it like that. This was a lot for one day. Um, every day is going to be like that. Um, like I said earlier, if, if you were all apprentices, uh, you'd still be drawing ovoids just by themselves. So um, we have about 15 more minutes. Uh, if you have gotten this far, finish that floating ovoid. Uh, and start something else. Draw another ovoid. Whatever you feel like you need to practice while we're still here. And if you have questions for me, now's the time. Um, 
don't not take advantage of me being here if you have a thought on your mind. I'm happy to talk about it. I want you to really pay attention to how shapes come together. Just how smooth and flowing uh, form line should be. Um, even when, when the form line is really thick and, or, or for, for a good example, even in Chilcat form line, there's still a flow to it. There, the shapes are related, the thicknesses are, are related, how uh, secondary elements and the complexity is distributed evenly throughout the design. There's a flow, and that's, that's not something that comes instantly. It's going to take, <laughs> like all of this, going to take some work. Um, but again, just like before, you see this space underneath what we've just drawn. Uh, you know, it says if you could, um, like if the edge of the paper was here, You know, there's a ton you can do, uh, you know, because because you attach this U-form here correctly, there's, you know, there's tons that can be done to then uh, expand on this. And that's all thanks to drawing the shapes well and connecting them uh, properly. So this, and we're going to get to all this kind of stuff in the coming days. So um, if, you're, if you're this far, like I said, draw another ovoid and connect a couple of U-forms. Um, the more you practice, the better. Pay attention to, as you connect those ovoids, or the U-forms coming off of the ovoid, that they're following the curve of the ovoid they're attached to. You're not... Uh, exaggerating that curve, you're not taking it quite to its, you know, full, full curve, but they are, they are coming off in a way that complements that, that angle of the bottom of the ovoid. So this, this shape here, this negative space uh, on this top little U-form here is called a trineg. Okay? Um, trineg just means three points of negative space. One, two, three. Tomorrow, when we talk about the things that can go inside of U-forms, they'll like in this case, if this was black, there'd be a red split that sits in here. That shape is called a split because it's the positive space. Drawing a split creates a trineg below it. I'm gonna do one right now just for fun. Okay, so you, this would be a positive space, red fine line. Okay, so that's a split. But the space it creates underneath it is a trineg. Because we're talking, trineg refers to the negative space. The positive space element here is called a split because it splits the space. We'll do lots more of these tomorrow. I, I can only imagine that we did. Um, it's one of my, uh, I think the things that nag me the most about what I've chosen to do for a career that I can't talk about it in my language. Um, I'm, my plan is, as my fluency improves, to create new words. The problem with that is there's always going to be a disconnect because those words are lost from whatever these things were meant to be really frustrating to, to I really I'm confident that I understand this art form I understand it as far as how it's put together why they connect the way they do um, the intricacies of, of that part of it I have no idea the origin of the shapes 
and why they chose to do them the way they do them. And I don't think I'll ever know, because those words are all gone. Maybe the words would have given a glimpse into, you know what I mean? What their frame of mind was when these things were created. Uh, that's a, it's a constant bitter taste in your mouth when you let yourself think about it. Um, so yeah, I, we'll do our... Really? Uh, as soon as they create a time machine, you know, I'll go back and find out. My buddy Tyson, who I'll reference more in this class because he's an amazing form line artist, uh, he always says, yeah, but if you go back 200 years ago, those guys are going to give you a different answer than if you go back 1,000 years ago. You know what I mean? It'll be a different reason. Maybe the words will be even be completely different by then. So, But that's, that's neat. That's interesting. What they that's, where they explain that when you that gig and you set it on a rock, yeah. it goes from this here to yeah, yeah. start to take that form. Yeah. So it keeps the inside. Yeah. Huh. That's a good idea. There's ways in Smalia to, um, where there's a word that looks exactly like another word. Like, what's a good answer? Uh, matter of fact, talking about salmon eggs, lan is a salmon egg. Um, but when you talk about salmon eggs and seaweed, you know, when you eat the dish, um, that's Lulansk. Lu means in, um, lan is uh, salmon eggs. And the SK at the end, all the experts don't really know how to explain it exactly, but they say that it changes the meaning of the root word away from what the root word meant but it's related to the root word. So somehow Lulansk means that's seaweed and salmon eggs, uh, but lan is salmon eggs. So I would have to do something like that to lan. Lansk, maybe. I'll talk to some fluent speakers about it. One of the problems, it's the same thing we, uh, when we were trying to do our basketry curriculum that we just put out. That was one of the reasons we did it. We didn't want basketry terms to be lost the way form line words were lost. Um, but all of those fluent speakers helping us aren't basket weavers. You know what I mean? So maybe there are, maybe we did lose some words here and there. Thank, there are a lot recorded uh, already, but um, it's tough. And it makes me wish that we had people who were wanting to learn our language whose profession was fishing. So they could go out and use all of the words for fishing that we're going to lose if people don't use use them, you know what I mean, for what they're meant for. Um, there's all kinds of careers like that, you could say that, you know, as long as we keep working in classrooms to learn our language, we're, we're missing out on really using it, you know? Um, one thing at a time. <laughs> Well, we're, we're closing in here. Uh, thank you, everybody. I, I really love doing this. I love the opportunity to do it. This is my third time this year teaching this. Um, I'm going to do one more before, two more before the year's out. And it sounds like they're going to have me back again to all the different places I did it uh, this year next year. I'll probably thank you every day 
and so just get used to it. I appreciate you all being here. Uh, tomorrow will be, every day will be another long day of drawing, so uh, steal yourselves, as they say, and we'll see you tomorrow. Thank you.